because we talk a lot and I think there's a lot of content put out about the elite rowers and what we do da, 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 da. but m- that's a very small proportion of, of the rowing in our country and I thought what what kind of lessons could club rowers learn and probably they're already maxing out on what they can do because they're working and they're training early morning and night and I think something like understanding each other and listening and personality types and the things that seem quite soft around the edges um additions to their program but we found really powerful something like that would enhance a club program massively i think what do you think no i was just gonna say that's one of the things i talk about the most is about communication between individuals in a crew and that idea of working together because like you say it's a huge sorry there's a cat there's a cat i've been been photobombed um video bombed um yeah so i think um like you say, it's the sort of thing that you don't need to spend, you know, more energy to do. So it's a perfect thing for for sort of club athletes to think about. Although I do think in a busy day, it can feel like oh, I don't have the time to have this conversation. It's going to be much easier to put the boat on the rack and go home and, you know, have a glass of wine. Um, so putting aside some time or just making sure that when you wind down, you do take time to chat to someone, something like that taking those opportunities um when it's when it's the first opportunity to do it that was one of my resolves going into the last year was if anything I feel like is coming up that needs to be addressed I will address it the first time it comes up I won't say to my I will not allow myself the sentence oh it'll be all right or I'll address it next time the other thing Jess I was thinking was that giving giving yourself permission when you're because I I remember when I was sort of at school and rowing and you just so much racing and there's just not much time between each race as a weekend. And then, you know, you've got to take the boat off the trailer, rig up again and you're tired and then you're just going to practice some more pieces. But making sure that they give themselves time to isolate a training session and say, well, we're going to practice starts. So we're going to when we when we leave the boathouse today, we want to know that we're really clear. Actually, how do we go off the start? We don't we don't need to get fitter, we don't need to get sharper, but isolating different parts of the race so you've got a really clear understanding. Yeah, it's something we had the luxury of in the squad, but but and I got quite um tunnel vision of just I loved doing the training programme, doing the mileage and doing it hard. And I think um something I actually learned from rowing in a group with Heather and Helen in the pair. Um, was taking the time to work on the, the tiny things and I would go out and say why, why aren't we just doing the session and instead they were like because we're just practicing the roll-up or the first inch and um I think having 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 a bigger picture of how your boat's going to get from A to B the fastest and it's not just going to happen because you've got the best cardiovascular system in the world is, is something that um, probably um, all, all rowers need to have a look at and be aware of and we can get really easily side sidelined because we're thinking too much about the hard training and not the am I, can I pick up the boat a little bit better at the front end that would take me weeks of ergo training to do or should I just put the blade in properly um, having having the humility to say you're wrong about something and, 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 the, and the openness to adapt and change um, I think is something I've learned post rowing through, through my last years of rowing and, and, and take it into Um, my job now is to just listen to others and see how other people are doing things because it might be better than your view and the way that you're doing it and and don't be too pig-headed to say I'm right and I'm this strong leader and doing it all well because you're not you're not no one's doing anything the best they can do it Um, and I that that kind of goes into how do you think the lessons you learn in rowing are are paying off in what everyone does now I know we're we're all three of us doing really different things but um Maybe we could have a little chat about those things we're doing now. I think there's two things that we did eventually learn how to do well in the crew that I have also feel like you can take into any aspect of life, really, which, again, was um, was around, well, it was around feedback and around meetings. So I think one of the things we eventually learned how to do, because when there's 10 people, sometimes 11, if, you know, James and Tom over there, it's a lot of people to talk in a meeting. And I think it took people a long time to realize that sometimes you don't have to say what's already been said in your own words. You can just say, I agree. And that's enough. You can just say, yeah, I 100% agree with what's just been said. You don't, and I, because I think quite often we'd have these meetings where literally everyone would say exactly the same thing, but would feel the need to say it. And actually that was completely unnecessary and just made everyone annoyed because our meetings always took like 300 hours. Um, 
And I think that's something that's really useful in everyday life is just knowing that you don't, you know, that's enough. If, if that's what you believe, if that's truly what you believe, it's enough just to say, yep, I completely agree with that. Mm. Um, and I think the other thing, which again is useful in all walks of life is about the way we gave each other feedback or kind of gave feedback to the crew. You know, we always kind of made a point of feedback had to be actionable. So we never just said, oh, the catches aren't good enough or something like that. You know, it was always, let's make the catches looser or, you know, there was always, it was always a, a something we could action rather than just a problem. Like there was always solutions rather than just the problems. And I think that's something that I've found useful in every walk of life, you know, even just in terms of how you, um, you know, talk to other people, how you get stuff done with administrators in whatever system you're working, you know, if you go in with a solution or, or a range of solutions, if appropriate, you know, these are a few things I thought of, would one of these things be something we could do? I think that's um, much more powerful than going in with just a problem. And that is definitely something that we did well. You know, it would always be, even if it was just something shouted from the bows, it was never just a grumble about something that wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. um, there was always some sort of suggestion or, you know, a, a positive word in there that, that would, mm -hmm. we had something to go off rather than just a mm -hmm. negative that we needed to figure out. Yeah, and specific as well, wasn't it? It was something that would progress. It was a progress thing rather than a comment and specific to the action, the action we needed to do. Yeah, and yeah. I think one of the things when we really learned that was those sessions, which I absolutely hated, which were the um, like nine five hundreds with 250 off in between. Oh, God. Because the thing was, is in an eight, by the time you've crossed the finish line of your 500, you're practically at the start line for the next one anyway. And we really had to get good at, you guys would shout, you know, one or two of you would shout something. And then it was really good for me because I then had to filter everyone's views and pick the one thing that we were going to do differently in the next piece. And then I had to feed that back to you guys straight away. And then we'd be winding up for the next, you know, the next piece. And I think that was those sessions, as much as I hated them, were probably really good for both our communication, everyone learning how to be succinct and be, you know, give that positive feedback. And also for me, in terms of how I made decisions and acted upon them quickly and kind of learn how to filter information and things. It's so true. I totally wiped those sessions from my brain. <laughs> but now you, now you, um, now you talk about it. I think that really built up. That really forced us to trust you to make that decision. You're filtering so much information. So when we were in that final in Rio, we already had that pattern of trust. It's like, mm. let's not comment on it. You do, it. There's no point having another opinion. We have to do with this. It, there, is, there is absolute urgency right now to, mm. to do what you have decided that w what the action will be. My memory is quite poor. Um, so I don't remember, for example, much about the race, but what I remember is, is that a lot of my job was just to tell you guys that we were doing fine and that we didn't need to do something mental and we were rowing good speeds and we were rowing well and you know I, which was why I think I never said okay well we're sick because that wasn't useful information because it wasn't really pertinent to what was going on around us like it was pretty clear that and we'd all be like we know <laughs> there's no one behind us <laughs> except for us in the house we were doing fine except for Ed, we thought we were winning um, but yeah, I mean, like, you know, I think that's the thing as a cox, you have a different perspective. So I can see if there are crews in front of me, I can see them. And I remember looking at um, the two crews who'd gone off the fastest and thinking, well, that's not sustainable. You know, the, the rhythm you're rowing is not sustainable. You look, everyone looked stressed, faces were stressed, I could hear them shouting at each other. And I thought, you know, these are not crews that we need to worry about, even though they're ahead of us at the moment. Um, and I just remember saying a lot of, you know, just keep doing what you're doing, keep pushing the legs down. And I don't think I did a huge amount else. I think that's interesting you talk about that because um, it brought me back to thinking what experiences going to the games bring. And, and I always keep remembering um, Tom, who's one of my coaches, that would always say it's, it's, things are going to be different at the games. Someone's going to someone's going to bomb. Someone's not going to get their timing right. Someone's going to someone might get sick. Someone might get injured because they've pushed too far. And someone will do something you don't expect them to do. And you just got to keep doing what you do. And I remember thinking that, I will probably afterwards, because in the middle of it, I might can barely breathe and can barely see, but um, 
looking back on it, you think those crew, fair play to those crews because they went out to do something that <laughs> sustained, but they went out to, 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 to be those crews that yeah. told about to be the ones that were going to just go do something absolutely crazy because it was the Olympic mm -hmm. Games and, and you've got to hold your head whilst that happens around you, I guess. I'm going back to your question about the book quickly. I was thinking, what did I think when I read it? Was it different to um, oh, yeah. How, yeah. how you brought it? Um, it's incredible and it's, it's a great kind of uh, reference point for me to look back on. And I read it and thought, wow, Frank thinks a lot. <laughs> 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 and it's all true. It's all stuff that we did. But I remember thinking, like, my training diary some days, I went back and looked back, like, <laughs> what do we do? 20K, 16K, weights. All right, we talked about pizzas or something. Like, there's no, and I'm like, oh man, I wish I'd written more stuff down. Um, but I think that brings me back to how incredible a, an athlete you, you are, and how much of a, an honour it was to get that last little bit of my career, getting a chance to ruin a boat with you. Because I think your your deep understanding of of the rowing stroke and rowing as a sport is incredible and it's the reason why you're multiple world champion olympic medalist because you you understand it and you something that you taught me is how how to dissect it and remember i'm very black and white and i think it's something i've learned to be better at so i'm already we'd either do a piece and i'd say that was the best piece we ever did <laughs> kid you would tell me off or we do a bad piece of that's the worst thing we ever did we're gonna lose and you taught me to um we we we'd really plan what we wanted to feel, what we got out of it, and you then you'd ask us in the boat. You know, it wasn't it wasn't an argument in the boat. But if you didn't understand something, you'd say, "I could I couldn't feel that." You tell me what you're feeling, and it helped me um, dissect my stroke a bit more, and and I guess think a bit more about what I was doing. Not that like 20 years in the sport, I was thinking about it, and it wasn't just pulling my oar as hard as I could, but. Um, that 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 depth and, and knowledge and wisdom you have about the rowing stroke and um, and how you view it is um, I'm sorry that everyone else doesn't get to row with you now because I think it's a really really special thing to have got to have experienced and I think that is something that, through reading your book again back and in, and in, in what you were feeling doing it sets you you are head and shoulders above everyone because so tall anyway but head and shoulders above uh, yeah a lot, many many people in the world of rowing i think it's just exceptional and that's why the book is a great book to go back and read not just for us that experienced it but for anyone out there that's a rower or a sports person it's so so methodical and precise that it's brilliant oh thanks jess <laughs> well it took me a long time i was very deliberate i really wanted to make it succinct so yeah. that it would be tangible and readable you know i could have written a tome i could write 50 pages on you know the yeah, excitement of going to Sydney, oh, you know, I really could, I could go on, um, but I really wanted it to be usable um, for those that find themselves, in, you know, just in a rowing boat and, and wanting to, to put together the best that they can put together with other people and the, the kind of things to be observant of. Um, so I'm really, I, it was deliberate to make it, to sort of pare it down. And I'm really glad that you know, that makes it more usable. I think as a follow-up, Fran, you could think about doing a um, travel guide to everywhere you've been rowing. <laughs> yes. The highlight being Brandenburg. Well, I was going to say, you could start with Brandenburg. Best place I've ever stayed, except there wasn't a lamp for me to do my cross-stitch in the room. Yeah. That was an emergency text. I wasn't I wasn't great on the old WhatsApp group, was I? I was just slow to warm up. But when I needed a lamp to do my cross-stitch, I could see the benefit of a group text. You make it sound like an old lady. The current squad are obviously facing something which none of us have ever had to face before. And I guess the question is, you know, obviously we're all no longer there. We can only give advice from afar, but... And we, we don't know what it's like to experience this, but I suppose what did we learn in not only just 2016, but our rowing careers before that we could give them some sort of help with about, you know, facing these these kinds of challenges? Yeah, I mean, I think particularly at the moment, we're in November, and I was actually just talking to Mel, who sat behind me in Rio um, the other day, and we were reminiscing about November as being the toughest time. You know, you're, this is when you're in the depths of the training. Like in the, in the eyes of a coach, this is where you get the physical stuff done. And then if someone's a bit off colour or they need a bit more space after Christmas, then you take it because there's not much time left to recover. Um, so, goodness. I mean, for me, I always just remember, right, you just got to keep going and get through November um, because you know time, time will tick much faster by come January February 
Um, you know, that just thinking of this year just reminds me of when we arrived in Gifu. Jess, you were in Gifu. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was a torrential current. It was, you know, you couldn't row on it. It was, it was horrific. It was, a, it was a typhoon. You just couldn't envisage how you could row. And Tomo just sat us down and said, they're still going to give out the medals. And I think that really just brought us back into focus. It's like, okay, it's probably going to be unfair. Everyone's in a different situation. This is not how I wanted it to be, but I still want one of those medals they're going to give out. So what am I going to take control of? What can I take control of? Um, because it's still going to happen. Um, obviously, fingers crossed, Tokyo does happen. Um, but yeah, I think that's what I would be looking back to. I guess they just got to take it, take it as like a rowing race. They've just got to keep taking one day at a time doing their training. I think it's incredibly hard. And yes, we're in the middle of a horrendous pandemic. Don't get me wrong. I can see this in perspective of the world, but um, it's it's their job to go rowing and they're trying to do their jobs. And it's, it's, a, it's a real mental thing. They don't know how it's going to pan out. So I think they've had a, a really incredible summer doing their training by themselves. And now they're kind of all bubbled. Um, but I think it's a, I think it's fair play to all of them. Because I think it's really, really tough. And I think they've just got to take it one session at a time and do the, do the best they can. They're still facing massive restrictions of how they train and how they share canvas gym and how they share the river. Um, and I think that's an extra pressure on them that none of us can ever understand. I can't understand it. Even me thinking about it now, I think, oh, the, the poor things. But um, they'll, it, it sounds horrendous, but they've all gone through this different journey together. And in a year's time, they'll, they'll have raced it and they can reflect back on have these phone calls themselves so how on earth we get through that um it would be really interesting to hear because i think you're you're suddenly throwing an extra thing at these athletes they're resilient they're tough there's a reason why they got to this stage of their careers and it'll be another thing that'll make them stronger i'm sure i'm sure you know you, you obviously we're in a pandemic there's a lot going on in the world and yes it is just sport and to some extent you think oh well it's just sport it doesn't really matter but actually it doesn't just matter to them, it matters to other people as well. And I think, you know, I was um, in the hospital talking to a patient who was talking about how much they just wanted to watch the World Cup. And, you know, they just really wanted to be able to watch the World Cup and kind of lose themselves in, you know, in football and in, in being behind their team and all this kind of thing. And it's the same with the Olympics. You know, people get behind it and people get behind sports which they don't usually care about in a normal year that brings people together um, and it doesn't seem like it should matter in the grand scheme of what's going on in the world at the moment but it does and it it brings a lot of people a lot of joy and um, sort of escapism and I think that's actually really important at the moment. I want to talk about why this book is a great Christmas present this on, 2020. Well, I think there's there's a couple of things. Obviously, it's beautiful and it's just lovely, and the the um, you know the the whole way it's set out is gorgeous, and the graphics are lovely. But also, you know, it's made by small um, producers, like local producers. You know, this isn't something that's been mass produced um, by a big company, so it's supporting small businesses and local businesses. But also, there's something that anyone can learn from it. I don't, I can't think of anyone who wouldn't be able to pick this up and find something that's useful to their life or their sport or their family or whatever so um that would be my i already have a copy but if i didn't i would buy myself one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think a fan talked about earlier um the book is just is, is really simple and its simplicity is is it's massive selling point because you can pick it up you can look at certain parts of it i mean i i was in it i'm in it my picture's in it but i look back at it now and still and my, i've learned things since i got hold of it um, you know, four weeks ago. And um, I think just as a good reference point for anyone, anyone, whatever sport you're in, to look back and say, how did, how did this person, Francis, feel at this certain time? Or how did she view herself? Or how did... And there's, there's not many kind of um, information books or um, any kind of publications that tell you that. So it's, it's really vulnerable of you and personal of you to let us all in and let us know what you thought and how you were feeling. Because uh, it's really honest, and I was there, Zoe was there for some of it, a tiny part of it, one-fifth. Um, and it's really true, it's really honest. I think it's, it's, it's a really exciting thing, an incredible thing for you to have done. Well done. Thanks, you too. Thanks very much.